I was recently asked why I put so much time and effort into speaking about New Zealand's national security. The same reason you should, I replied. For our children, nieces, nephews and their children. Hi, I'm Simon Ewing Jarvi. It's our responsibility to live a better, safer, freer country than we inherited. And the only way that's going to happen is if ordinary citizens are involved in the national security conversation. That conversation should start with a comprehensive national security strategy being formulated, not the compartmentalised and under-resourced thinking which has been allowed to take hold, because that is indefensible, New Zealand. Morning, Heather. $15 billion. Was that enough for national security for New Zealand, you reckon? Well, it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But um, how does it break down? We've just had a, had a budget. How did those figures break down? Hmm. Well, obviously it's not just defence. What I've done is taken all the obvious agencies within the uh, budget that contribute to national security, things like the Serious Fraud Office, Security Intelligence Service, um, Government Communication Security Bureau, Customs, Justice, Courts, Biosecurity, Foreign Affairs, Police Corrections, and as I said, Defence. Defense. So yeah. it's, a, it's the holistic view of keeping Kiwi safe, which is the theme that we've been discussing all the way along on the series and, and in other places as well. So what percentage of GDP does that $15 billion come out at? About 4.5%. If you want uh, some simple comparisons, uh, social welfare at 36 billion, health 24.4 billion, and education 19.4 billion. And so even that number 15 billion, sound, even though it sounds big, it's not actually a big chunk of our overall government spending. No, when you look at it compared to those big social um, social areas, mm. it's it's quite small. Yep. So when when I was a minister, I used to have all sorts of people coming and wanting to talk to me about different initiatives. And my question after they'd told me what it was they wanted was always, so how much money is enough? And so I'm going to pose that question to you. How much do you think we actually need to fund adequate national security for New Zealand? Um, I don't think anyone knows. And... Rather than try and put a number on it in the here and now, what I would suggest is the ask, ask the question in reverse. Do we have all the capabilities we need to deal with likely contingencies? So can we, can we, for instance, keep everyone safe in the streets and homes? Uh, can we project an expeditionary force into the southwest Pacific to deal with an event there? Uh, and can we um, remain viable as a nation where our sea lanes of communication to be disrupted or even cut off by some action elsewhere. Yeah. And oh. the answer to each one of those questions is we don't have enough capability in mm. those areas, so therefore we need more money. And it really speaks to why we need the National Security Agency and the National Security Strategy to sit down and actually do that, do that thinking. Yes, and have that and have the right conversations. The other thing, I, I think that's a great answer, and I didn't usually get that sort of answer when I asked the question. It was always a wee bit tongue in cheek. Mm. Um, but you do need to decide what you want to, what you need to do first. Actually, um, the other the other comment I would make is you've listed about ten agencies there. Mm. There's probably other bits that filter into that uh, that fall under a national security umbrella as well. But at the moment, they're operating largely in silos. Yep. And so if you had a national uh, security approach, there would, I think, likely be significant efficiencies that could be made by some of those organisations pairing up and doing things together. Yeah. So it's about efficiency of spending as well as uh, determining what you need and having the right allocation, isn't it? Yeah, and you only have to look at how uh, our intelligence functions are spread across multiple silos to see the problem there. and. You know, having a little combined threat assessment group isn't the solution to that. There's, there's other things we'll talk about in that space. But you're absolutely right. For instance, biosecurity is in this list, and that includes agriculture, fisheries, and food safety, as well as the technical side of biosecurity. So there's, there's lots and lots of elements to, to national security, to keeping people safe. And it starts with a resilient country, and that costs money. Yeah. And that's why we need to talk about how do we, how do we pay for this. That's right. And so how do we um, realistically shift that 4.3% of GDP mm. to something that better reflects what we need to do to protect ourselves as a nation? Yeah, well, there's going to be a lump of cash needed to actually move from unprepared and lacking in resilience to being in the right position. I don't think it's a huge ongoing spend. And the example I use is Switzerland, where they 
they adopted an armed neutral position quite early on and now they're, they're a highly capable highly resilient country uh, but they don't actually spend a bucket load of money on on maintaining it no, about 5.7 percent or something they do have very strong economic growth which is something that new zealand hasn't had when you look at the figures over well you can go back quite a way actually and see that we've, we've not done that well yeah let's talk about the gdp figures our gdp our gross domestic product and the rate it grows is the main indicator of uh, how uh, we can afford of what we can afford to do right mm. That's right. So at the moment it's negative 2.3%. Um, obviously COVID has had a, an impact. We had a March quarter 1.6% uh, growth, but overall it's negative. And this is uh, taken from Stats New Zealand and also from the World Bank. Now that figure puts us basically, it compares, compares with Liberia and Sudan in 2019. <laughs> They're not countries that we normally want to compare ourselves with. No, so let's um, let's look back to when this government, for instance, came into power in the, at the end of uh, 2017 mm-hmm. and before COVID. At that time, uh, they inherited an economy running at about 3.5% annual growth. Is that good? Well, it's not. we've done better. We, we achieved uh, 6.6% uh, back in June 1994. So that was Ruth Richardson's time. It was, yes. Mm. So obviously um, that that national government was um, benefiting in some degree, well, quite a lot, quite a large degree from the uh, changes that had been made in the 80s. Yes. Uh, but we've never really done that well again. It slowly slid down, hovered around 6, and it's, it's basically settled down around 3.5%. Now, we like to compare ourselves to certain countries, and I don't think most people would expect to find that that... 3.5% annual GDP growth is slightly better than Vanuatu, but worse than Bulgaria, worse than Guatemala, and worse than Afghanistan's 2019 figures. So what are the what, what are the countries that are doing quite well in terms of growth? Well, Bangladesh in 2019 managed to grow its economy by 8.2%, Ethiopia 8.4%, and Rwanda 9.4%. What are we doing to stay where we are? Hmm. So you know, um, you know a bit about this, Heather. What would you do to uh, ramp up the economy? Well, there's quite a number of options that governments have when they want to facilitate economic growth, mm. um, and it's a bit like, you know, I think we should think of it in simple terms and more like running your own household. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sort of think make government spending very complex, but in fact the principles are the same as running your, your budget yourself. So firstly, you can try and do more but spend less, or earn more but spend less. Mm-hmm. Um, that's never particularly palatable with voters uh, because they want to see more, but that certainly is an option. And we, we should always be remembering that government money isn't government government money, it's our money, it's the taxpayer money, that's where it's come from. So we should always be striving for a better quality spend of that taxpayer money. Another option we have is debt reduction. Now we know that this government has made a conscious choice to increase debt hugely. Uh, it's getting close to the 50% of GDP mark. Previous governments had worked really hard to try and bring that down, including uh, you know, not just the national government before it, but also the previous Labour government, Michael Cullen, uh, got debt down significantly. We've made a conscious decision, or the government on our behalf has made a conscious decision to increase debt hugely to get us over the COVID hump. Um, but I think, I, I believe the reports that say we're only midway there, so there's a lot to roll out there yet. Mm. Um, and we can't really entertain the idea of taking a whole lot more debt on. It should be paid back, so that debt reduction, I would say, is a key thing. It needs to be reeled back and paid back as quickly as we can to stimulate the economy again. Um, We can make changes to our tax system. I think I've believed for a long time that our tax system um, is looked at the wrong way around. It's a bit like, let's see how much we can get out of the taxpayer, and then we'll work out how to spend it, rather than having a conversation as a nation and saying, what should government actually provide for the people because they can't do that themselves? Mm. Once you've decided what those things are, then you work out how much you need to pay for them. So it's a bit like the way you started on the podcast saying, you know, we spend 15 billion, uh, is that enough? Mm. So what do we want to provide? Then work out what that figure should be. Incentives need to be in the right place and really there I'm referring to how do we get our productivity up. Our productivity as a nation 
has never been that great and over the last few years has become worse. New Zealanders work pretty hard but we don't produce much for that and we need to find ways to work smarter, not harder. We're already working quite hard. Um, so you can have more people producing more. That would mean, because we know that we've got low unemployment at the moment and there's jobs that New Zealanders just don't want to do, that does speak to having more immigration. Mm. And we need to have sensible discussions about how we do that. And then the last thing, of course, is um, automation. Mm. So let's produce more by having more automation in, in the economy and moving uh, the human resource that we have to working much smarter than we do at the moment. It would appear at the moment that the national security system is underfunded, but that we, that we can't really afford to do that much, much more. more. Yeah. Mm. So the only choice in growing national security capability is to grow the economy, and hence this podcast. The, the lack of urgency in addressing the need to grow the whole economy is quite concerning. And from a national security point of view, let's just summarise it like this. If there's going to be a hot war, a shooting war in our region, we're obviously planning on winning in two or three days because that's all the, the ammunition and rockets we have. And we won't be getting any more sent by ship. We have insufficient uh, fuel stocks to move our warships, armoured vehicles, even ambulance, police, fire, if we're cut off from fuel supply, there will be no emergency service vehicles moving around this country in a relatively short period of time. And having the option to get some fuel from Japanese reserves isn't an option if the sea lanes are closed. So we really do need to think about growing the economy, if for no other reason than to be able to grow our resilience. And this is really just a macro level approach to what we ask every individual to do in terms of civil defence and emergency management about having having water, having food, mm. bits and pieces around your house. We, let's talk about that at a national level. There might be some talk going on about it, but there's not much action going on and the excuse is often we can't afford it. Yeah, which comes brings you just right back in a circle to um, stronger economic growth. Yep. I'm a great believer in the, the saying, a rising tide lifts all ships or lifts all boats. Mm. And if we've got stronger economic growth, it benefits every every area of um, government, every area of our country. And so the argument is often one of, well, we can't do this, we can't pour more money into health mm. and put more money into national security at the same time. But by, by focusing on better productivity and stronger economic growth, that tide does lift and it provides more money for all of those things. So it's not about an, an either-or situation, it's actually about improving the outlook for the whole country, mm. including being more generous to those who are truly vulnerable in our society. Yeah, this old um, gag about, you know, you can get 400 hip replacements for a tank yes. um, is really a pointless discussion. We, we need to be able to do the things that we need to do as a country, and that includes hip replacements and having the appropriate vehicles for our defence force. Mm. You were talking to me earlier about the Productivity Commission report. I was. The Productivity Commission does a lot of great work, and it's it's worth going to their website and seeing the different projects that they've done. But in their annual report for 2019, they made some pretty blatant statements about New Zealand's poor productivity. And I, There's a section in it called Shifting into Higher Gear, and I just want to quote one piece out of that, because I think it's very relevant to the conversation that we're having. So it said, a key characteristic of New Zealand's relatively weak economic performance has been poor productivity. The economy is like a car stuck in first gear, where faster growth comes from revving the engine rather than driving more efficiently. This comes at a cost to living standards. Lifting productivity would shift the economy into higher gear and put economic growth on a more sustainable footing. And I thought that was a great analogy, Simon, the, yeah. the one of the car revving the engine harder. That, it feels that we're stuck in that mode of just pushing the accelerator a bit harder but going nowhere. And wearing the engine out. That's right. And look, it goes. that report goes on to talk about... Um, where reform needs to happen and it's really everywhere it's about improving uh, competition it's about having better infrastructure investing in science innovation but also looking at the public sector and getting more measurability and accountability there mm. um, it's not saying that we shouldn't have a public sector or it should be hugely smaller it's saying that we just need to get better out of those policy decisions that are being made as mm. well mm. and those are the things that really will grow um, drive strong economic growth 
great. Well, um, that was uh, something a little bit different for you people who love talking about tanks and planes. Uh, but don't worry, that's coming. If you think that preparing for good solid national security resilience is expensive, try fighting a war. That's it for this episode of Indefensible New Zealand. Thanks for joining the National Security Conversation. If you found this podcast episode useful, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more information on New Zealand's national security or to send in questions for the series, please go to my website, unclass.com. Mm-hmm.